Uh, yeah, you'll see Kevin Costello's footprint all over the uh, discussion. So, so I would like to discuss um, some topics about uh, related to the supersymmetric quantum field theories and the and the twist. So a way to extract uh, protected information from supersymmetric quantum field theories in a system systematic way. Uh, this is a very large subject. Uh, in, in mathematical physics, and I will sort of focus on theories in three dimensions, uh, just because they uh, provide a good example of a lot of the ideas that, that are important. Uh, and I've been working on this subject a lot. Uh, so, so supersymmetric quantum field theories. Um, Almost all quantum field theories are used to uh, have a basic set of symmetries, translation symmetry and Lorentz invariance. A supersymmetric quantum field theory is a quantum field theory which has an extra symmetry, which is Grassmann-Odd, uh, a collection of symmetries actually, which are Grassmann-Odd, exchange bosons and fermions, and uh, form a an algebra which, uh, whose commutators involve the translations. So essentially, the supersymmetry is the square root of the translation. Uh, generators. And in a unitary theory, they transform in a spinner representation of the Lorentz group. Now, um, even if you're not studying supersymmetric quantum field theory, there is a place where you're encounter surely encountered before uh, Grassmann of symmetries, which is if you've been doing BRST quantization of, of, uh, of some gauge theories or some constraint systems. So you remember when you try to do BRST quantization of a, of a, of a, uh, of a constraint system, uh, you embed it into a larger system with some auxiliary degrees of freedom, uh, which simplify the quantization process, and then you introduce a, a BRST odd symmetry, a Gassman odd symmetry BRST, BRST charge, uh, with the property that essentially the degrees of freedom you care about are the ones that are fixed by this symmetry. Uh, and, and you want to throw, and the, and the symmetry helps you throw away everything else. Essentially, you define your, your your actual theory by taking a cohomology with respect to this Grassmann generator. Uh, in a way, it is perfectly analogous to study uh, cohomology of a space instead of functions on a space. So, one thing you can do when you have a theory which has supersymmetry is that you can pick one of the supercharges and treat it as if, as if it was a BRST operator. And as a result, uh, you decouple. Uh, you sort of you identify as a collection of quantities which are invariant under this symmetry and that form a sort of sub theory which is isolated from the rest of the theory. Um, so the, the idea of twisting is to take a nilpotten supersymmetry generator and focus on the part of the theory which is invariant under that, generate, that symmetry generator. And this sort of sub theory that you identify still captures some information about the original theory, but has the advantage that this, it might be way much more computable than your typical, uh, than your, than your typical question in quantum field theory. In particular, it's perfectly possible that among the things that you throw away by passing to cohomology, uh, you throw away a lot of the couplings so that uh, what's left is essentially independent on a lot of the couplings of the theory. And if you're lucky, it might, it might even, be, even be energy flow invariant. And I'll come back to this later. So, uh, typically there are a variety of ways to do this, uh, depending on the amount of supersymmetries you are in, you have, you have the amount of dimensions your quantum field theory lives in, and on a specific shows on the important supercharge. Uh, if you are in three dimensions, uh, this is a chart of the sort of things you can do by twisting supersymmetric quantum field theory. In three dimensions, supercharges come in pairs just because spinners in three dimensions have two components. The minimum, the minimum amount of supersymmetry that theory can have is called n equal one, which is just two supercharges. And in that case, none of those is nilpotent. They all is always square to some translation. Uh, and as a result, uh, you cannot do any twists. If you have more than two, if you have 
more than a minimal amount of supersymmetry, twice as much or four as much, you have instead some interesting twists. Now, an important thing to, uh, sorry, what is that? I don't know why, okay. An important thing to know about uh, twisting is that once you pick one of the supercharges to do the twist, the remaining supercharges give you an important tool, meaning it's often the case that the commutator between one of the other supercharges and the supercharge shows is one of the translation generators. As a result, your translation, some of your translation generators become BRST exact. They, 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 they are part of what you're throwing away. So for example, it might be that the derivative of, the, of your operators in some directions uh, is too exact and, it can, and the couples. So essentially that means that when you study your, the correlation of functions in this protected subsector, uh, they end up being effectively independent of many of the directions of space time. If they are, they are independent of all directions of space time, your theory is called topological. Simply because the correlation functions are just numbers that might possibly depend on the topological configuration of your system, but not on the actual positions of individual uh, ingredients that you put in a correlation function. In other situations, maybe not all the translations are go away, but uh, you keep some holomorphic derivatives, but you throw away the antilomorphic derivatives. So your correlation functions might depend only holomorphically on, on some directions in space-time. Uh, I should stress that even if, even if the theory is topological and has, uh, it can still be rather non-trivial. Even in the, in the context of physical theories, you know, real lab physics, uh, you can encounter interesting topological field theories. Essentially, any gap system which has non-trivial entanglement properties like the quantum Hall effect, uh, give, gives rise to niches in topological field theory. The theories we are studying here uh, are not unitary, typically. Meaning the original physical theory is unitary, but the process of, trans of treating a, a supersymmetry as a BRST charge uh, ruins the unitarity of the theory. Essentially because you need to pick one of, this, one of the components of this. Uh, essentially because you need to manipulate the theory in such a way that this, this one of these charges becomes a scalar instead of a spinner. And then you have a Grassmannov scalar and that breaks the spin statistics relation. Um, so this sort of sub theories, these twi this twisted sectors of the theories do not enjoy unitarity. Um, and this actually allows the topological field theories that you encounter to be even richer than the ones that you would find in a unitary set setting. Uh, essentially because a unitary topological field theory cannot have local operators, while a non-unitary non one can. Now, so now I can go back to this chart. If you have twice the minimum amount of supersymmetry, which means su four supercharges, uh, then there you can find an important supersymmetry but only of the holomorphic topological type, meaning that one of the three directions of space-time will become topological, and the other two will combine into a complex coordinate. So your correlation functions will say not depend only on the position on the plane, not in the third direction, and it will depend on the position of the plane only holomorphically. That's what's an holomorphic topological theory. Um, yeah. Usually you don't encounter holomorphic topological theories in physics. You do encounter holomorphic theories all the time. Uh, for example, if you study a Carl Fermi in two dimension or the edge modes of a, of a, of a quantum Hall system. Those are two dimensional holomorphic systems where all correlation functions depend holomorphically on the coordinates. Uh, these holomorphic topological systems are a bit more exotic uh, and not very well studied, but it's in uh, interesting. One of the interesting features of these holomorphic topological theories is that you can use algebraic geometry to great effect in doing calculations. Uh, and it is one of the 
messages I, I want to transmit is that algebraic geometry rules in this sort of in the study of topologically twisted of twisted uh, supersymmetric quantum field theories. And in it, I'll describe a few several situations where some calculations were just outside of the ability of physicists to do, but algebraic geometers learn how to do them. Uh, now, if you have twice as much, four times as much the minimum amount of, minimum amount of supersymmetry, then you get to have topological twists. Actually, there are two different topological twists called the A twist and the B twist. And you still have the original holomorphic topological twist that you inherit from uh, n equal two supers, from, from n equal two. And actually, the true topological twists can be seen as deformations of the holomorphic topological twist, uh, which is quite important because it means that if you're willing to sort of ignore for a moment that all three all three directions space time are supposed to be the same in these topological theories you can apply methods of algebraic geometry uh, to study the topological twists as well and this is one of the contexts where as i was mentioning some algebraic geometers such as Braverman, finkel and nakajima made great progress uh, in the last few years now what can you study in a topologically twisted theory? What are the observables that you can, study, you, can, you can study? So, the correlation functions don't depend on positions if you just look at a cohomology. So, if, I take, if you just look at a heuristic cohomology and you take two local operators, you can just bring them together without having to worry about any singularities. There cannot be any singularities in the cohomology because the correlation function is constant. And so the very basic object you find is some kind of a ring of local operators, which is commutative, essentially because you can bring them together in all possible directions and you get the same answer. Now, if you just limit yourself to, to that sort of, uh, those sort of question, you know, uh, homology of local operators and how do I bring them around and bring them together, uh, you lose a lot of interesting information which is actually hidden in the precise way uh, the, the position dependence is trivial. Uh, one way you can think about it is that if you take the derivative of an, oper of an operator, the derivative is exact, is Q of something. Is, so it, it is zero if you insert it in the correlation function. But you can take this other thing, this O prime, and integrate it along a line, say. And you get an operator which is extended, uh, in a sense, is, is mere ground, but is actually BRST closed. Because you take Q of this, you, take, you get a total derivative integrated along a line, which gives you zero. Uh, this is called the descent relation. Uh, so using the descent relation, you can sort of build more complicated operations where say I take an operator, I take another operator, I apply the descent relation to get something that can be integrated, and I integrate this thing around the second operator. Uh, mathematically, uh, one way you can say this is that the local operators in the three-dimensional topological field theory form any tree algebra which is an algebra which has an infinite tower of opera extra operations of higher cohomological degree, which encode the homotopies for the more basic operations. Um, this is, so you get an algebra model on what's called the opera of little cubes. Uh, in the specific case at hand, in practice, all of the, most of these higher operations are uh, trivial, but there, is, there are some non-trivial ones. There is a particular a Poisson structure, a Poisson algebra structure on your local observables. So uh, in these topologically twisted theories, in three dimensions, you get an algebra of local operators equipped with a Poisson bracket. Um, one way to think about it is that the, the original physical theories, the n equal 3D n equal 4 theories, uh, have more protected modelized spaces of vacua called the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch. 
which are hypervacular manifold, in particular complex symplectic manifolds. And there are operators in the theory whose expectation values give functions on these spaces of vacuum, holomorphic functions on these spaces of vacuum. And these are the, theory, the operators which survive the topological twist. And so you get that in the A twist, you get, say, a Poisson algebra of holomorphic functions on the Higgs branch of the theory. And in the B twist, you get the holomorphic functions on the Coulomb branch. And so this is one of the, the basic observables that you could, could compute out of these topological theories. Uh, if you look at a standard sort of quantum field theory with, an, you know, with a nice Lagrangian, some gauge fields and some matter fields and then equal force supersymmetry, uh, one of the topological twists is simpler than the other. So the operators that survive in the Higgs branch are essentially polynomials in the matter fields. There are some complex scalars in the theory, and the operators who survive the twist are sort of gauge invariant polynomials of these complex scalars. And all the multiplication, the Poisson bracket, are just defined in a very simple way in terms of these elementary scalars. Uh, essentially, the, the Higgs branch is some kind of a symplectic quotient of a, of a linear space. On the other hand, the Coulomb branch is much more uh, complicated because the local operators whose expectation value parameterize the Coulomb branch are not polynomials in the elementary fields. Instead, they are disorder operators called monopole operators, which are defined by saying that you specify a certain singularity in the gauge fields at the point where you want to insert your operator. And then you put the path integral with these uh, modified boundary conditions. Uh, doing calculation with these other operators is not notoriously difficult. Even defining them properly is quite difficult. Uh, for example, if you try to define these monopole operators in a non-abelian gauge theory, you can specify the singularity up to gauge transformations. But then you need to work very hard to figure out what are the gauge transformations which are actually allowed, uh, what are the boundary conditions on the gauge, on the gauge transformations and on the fields, uh, which define a nice phase space you can quantize. And then trying to figure out what's the, what happens when I bring together through these monopole operators require understanding a, a whole space of field configurations, which are sort of localized in the neighborhood of these two points. Uh, this is tricky, but uh, Brian Manfinger and Nakajima managed to do it using algebraic geometry. Uh, they, build, they build an algebra using uh, something called the affine Grassmannian, uh, which sort of controls, controls these infinite spaces of gauge transformations. And so, uh, although until a few years ago, the only Coulomb branches that are known had been deduced using string theory or other, other tricks. Now, thanks to the work of Prabhama Finger and Nakajima, we have a precise definition of the Coulomb branch for the 3D and four theories. Because it's a bit of a bittersweet victory because this calculation in algebraic geometry are still quite hard to understand for a non-algebraic geometer. So uh, uh, it becomes more challenging for physicists to follow the topic. But uh, that's okay. In a sense, uh, in many ways, uh, supersymmetric the twisted supersymmetric quantum field theories uh, are becoming more and more uh, of a rigorous mathematical topic about which you can, you know, throw theorems and do uh, exact mathematical calculations. So they're, they're moving into a hybrid space in between math and physics. Much as it happened to things like vertex algebras uh, or mirror symmetry years ago. I wanted to mention another tool which is often in, uh, encountering these uh, calculations, which is called omega deformation. So omega deformation, it sort of simplifies the problem further uh, by making the problem one dimensional. In general, 
it allows you to sort of eliminate a few direction space time uh, and localize your theory to the fixed points of some isometry, say the rotation of a plane. Now you have now you have the operators that were free to move in three dimensions are now restricted to stay on the line. Uh, you, def you get the deformed algebra, which now is not necessarily commutative because it makes a diff you, you cannot deform this configuration to this configuration without leaving the line. So the result is sort of a, def a non commutative deformation of what was your original Poisson algebra. It's li literally a deformation quantization of this Poisson algebra. Now, I would like to stress that these manipulations, although rather abstract, uh, keep capturing some important data of the original physical theory. So uh, these three dimensional and equal four theories are a very nice way to produce conformal field theories, super conformal field theories, uh, which have a variety of applications, including holography. It just so happened that the quantization of these algebras using omega formation, as exotic as it might look, actually captures a whole collection of three point functions in these super conformal field theories. Uh, and it has even been used in, in the bootstrap program. So it's, there is a general hope that if you, you can bootstrap the whole collection of correlation functions of the conformal field theory just by using some small amount of data together with the restriction of uh, uh, crossing symmetry, the requirement that a four-point function can be decomposed into different OPE channels. Uh, so the conformal bootstrap has been applied to quite successfully to a variety of theories over the last few years. It's a, it's a purely numerical program, but it really holds the hope to give full solutions of, uh, of quantum field theories. And um, this sort of protected data has been used to great success in the process of bootstrapping uh, super conformal and conformal theories. Um, so it's often the case that in, in sort of more physical problems or in holography, uh, or any situation we can you can bootstrap more data out of some small collection of uh, correlation functions these supersymmetric twist these localization methods uh, can be used to great effect okay so this is more or less all i wanted to say about the topological twist of 3d uh, theories now I can discuss a little uh, the holomorphic twist. So when you have an holomorphic topological theory, now your correlation functions can have a dependence on position. So in principle, the collision of two operators might be might give you a singularity, just as it happens in two dimensions when you get holomorphic of these. But that cannot really happen here because when I collide two operators, I can just displace them in the topological direction first, and then they cannot. They cannot touch each other, and so there is no there is no actual singularity. So again, if you look at yourself, if you just focus on the cohomology of the of local operators, you throw every, every way everything that is directly exact. Uh, you you all only get just some kind of a ring uh, of local operators, perhaps with some reg, with some uh, uh, non-divergent of E as operators come together with some holomorphic coefficients. So that operator one colliding with operator two, operator one at Z or colliding with operator two at Z uh, can be expanding the power, some power theory in Z. But again, uh, there is a lot of information hidden into the uh, homotopies, hidden into sort of um, uh, the sent relations. So you can try to build higher operations which mix up the topological and holomorphic directions in trivial ways. Now, in this case, the actual mathematical structure is not quite understood yet. I mean, abstractly, you can say that it's some kind of an E1 algebra of Karel algebras, but I don't think anybody has sat down and really worked out exactly what it means. Uh, in a recent paper with Costello and, and Dimofte, we did do a few calculations of, of concerning these hagger operations. 
but not we don't have a full a full uh, story yet. Um, now, why would you care about these holomorphic topological twists? The reason I care is because they are available in situations where you don't have much supersymmetry. And theories which have a small amount of supersymmetry uh, can have very interesting physics. For example, if you look at four dimensional equal one gauge theories, uh, well, they are nice toy models, not really toy models. They have confinement, they have all sorts of interesting phenomena we'd really like to understand better. Unfortunately, there is no topological twist for the unical one theories. And there are holomorphic twists, though. And the holomorphic twist of four dimensional unical one theory might potentially give us some interesting information, but has not been studied yet. So, so I think in general that these holomorphic twists have the chance to uh, provide new insights on physically interesting theories. And now that, that you know, algebraic geometers have shown that very intricate computations are actually possible uh, in these holomorphic twists, I think it's really a good time to, to look at the problem in detail. Let me give a mathematical motivation for studying these holomorphic topological twists, at least in three dimensions. So one of the uh, reasons mathematicians started looking about at three dimensional unequal four theories over the last few years is something called symplectic duality, which is a general uh, collection of discoveries and conjectures in uh, representation, geometric representation theory. Essentially, uh, people studying simplectic duality notice that certain that, that there was a way to associate uh, categories to certain symplectic complex symplectic cones, and often the categories associated to certain pair of cones would have some deep relationships. And if you look at it, so they produced a, an increasing list of pairs of cones which have some kind of relationship with each other, and then. People noticed that this list was the same as the list of pairs of Higgs and Coulomb branches for non trivial four theories. So at the moment, we can say that symplectic duality is a collection of statements relating the Higgs and Coulomb branch geometries of some three dimensional unical four theory. Now, the statements are not exactly easy to, to present. Uh, they concern the, the so called category O of highest weight modules for the quantized algebra functions on these uh, this geometries. And they involve a, a sequence of non-trivial steps whose uh, origin is rather mysterious. In particular, to, to get this implicit duality, mathematicians had to take this category O, decompose it into pieces, and then reassemble it with an extra grading, which seemed to come out of nowhere. And then the duality relation requires you to exchange this new grading with the, with the cohomological grading of your category. So it's a causal duality. Now, I think physics is a good chance to explain this, uh, this trade procedure in the sense that category O is quite a natural object to study in these topological field theories. Uh, and the holomorphic, as I was saying, you can study these topological field theories as a deformation of an holomorphic topological theory. The holomorphic topological theory has an extra grading that is lost in the topological theory. And, it, and the, so this, this, theory, this holomorphic topological theory has two gradings, and one of them is used as a cohomological grading in the A twist, and that is using as, as a cohomological grading in the B twist. So I think the, what's going on in simplectic duality is that somehow these mathematicians are taking a structure in the topological A twist, lifting it to the holomorphic topological twist, and then pushing it down to the topological bit twist. And so, because of this general expectation, mathematicians are trying to make sense of this homomorphic topological twist on trilinical four at the moment. Uh, and I think it's 
likely that in the next few years uh, they'll be able to derive and extend simplet duality uh, along these physical lines. Now, until now, I talked about uh, point like defects, uh, just local operators. Now, quantum field theory has more ingredients than just local operators. Uh, and especially when you study things like topological field theories, uh, extended operators are really important. For example, suppose you're studying those. Uh, Topo those examples in condensed matter physics, like the quantum wall effect, where you have some topological quantum matter, where you have some uh, low energy, some, some, some gap system, such that low energy physics is described by topological field theory. There, as I mentioned, there are just not lo no local operators at all. The things you study instead are called anions, which are line defects, extend, you know, defects along, extending along time in the low energy theory. And a lot of the information is captured in, in statements about how these anions behave when you move them around, when you braid them uh, or, or fuse them. So in general, it's useful to study modifications of the quantum field theory along all some manifolds of space time. I call these just defects. When you put a defect in a theory, uh, you get a lot of new ingredients. For example, there will be now a collection of local operators which can be defined on the defect and are different from the local operators that you can define away from the defect. And when you have, say, a defect of dimensionality 2, you can put the defects of dimensionality 1 on it, which might be different from the ones that are available in the bulk. So there's a whole big hierarchical structure of defects, uh, which is usually, usually described using with the help of category theory. Uh, for example, suppose that you want to study the line defects of a topological theory. So a collection of ways to, to modify the, the quantum field theory along the line. And then you can put local operators. There are local operators that will live only on these lines. You can also have local operators which transform a line into another line. So you have a situation where every, every pair of defects is associated to some linear space of local operators that you can insert between one and the next. And if you're in a topological field theory, different, different local operators can be fused uh, by just bringing them to each other. So there is a notion of composition of local operators. So that means that essentially you get for free a category that is the, the structure of this top of these defects and the local operators into the topological field theory is described naturally by a category. Where the objects are the lines and the morphisms are the local operators. Depending on the dimensionality of space-time and on the properties of the theory in the in the transverse directions. This category can gain extra operations. For example, if the, net, if the top theory is topological in the transverse plane too, I can take two lines and fuse them together. This gives me a monoidal structure on the category. If, the, if, if I'm on the plane, I just get this monoidal structure. If I'm in three dimensions, I can bring the lines together in different directions. And I get a braided monoidal structure. And so on and so forth. If, if the transverse direction is holomorphic, then I get something more complicated where I bring lines together, but in a way that depends on the, on the direction in an holomorphic way. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure what the correct mathematical structure for this kind of is, but I think it's something similar to a car, something called the Carroll category. And so, and this, this idea sort of, uh, can be applied at all orders, at all dimensionality of the defects. So now, if I study surfaces in a theory, between two different surfaces, I can put a line. And I can have multiple types of line between the two surfaces. And then there can be local operators within the, the lines 
between the surfaces. So you get sort of naturally get an, an higher categorical setting. Maybe you get two category of two dimensional objects in, in your theory, which depending on the dimensionality might get uh, higher operations. So this whole, if your theory is topological, the whole, this whole complicated structure is captured by, mathemat by the mathematics of extended topological field theory. In an holomorphic topological setup, it's still to be determined. So, anyway, so, sorry. Right, so an, an example of a problem mathematicians at PI are studying at the moment is to find the correct, what are the categories of line defects in the 3D nickel for theory. You know, in the A twist or in the B twist, what's the category of, of line defects? Now, A situation where, uh, which occurs often and which is quite interesting, is a situation where the three-dimensional theory you're working with is topological, but you're looking at boundary conditions or two-dimensional defects which are holomorphic. So that you have, in the bulk, your local operators can be moved around freely, but on this two-dimensional locus, your local operators, the correlation function of local operators, depend holomorphically on your position. So this, this gives a situation where essentially you can have a carl algebra of local, of local operators on your two-dimensional defect, uh, which interacts with the topological field theory in the ambient space. The simplest example of this setup uh, is found when you study three-dimensional Chesamos theory. Now remember, three-dimensional Chesamos theory is, is a nice unitary topological field theory used in all, of, all over theoretical physics, uh, which has some interesting collection of anions, which form some monoidal uh, tensor category, some braided tensor category. And one of the ways you can study this, this category is by studying the properties of, of boundary conditions of Chesamos theory. If you give a boundary to Chesamos theory, you naturally find a WCW model, a Carroll WCW model at the boundary. Carol Weissman-Witten model, the boundary, which means you essentially find a rational vertex algebra, rational Carol algebra, the boundary. And uh, now you can study the line defects of your three-dimensional theory by looking at what happens to their endpoints on this Carol boundary condition, where they give you interesting modules for the Carol algebra. And so you get statements such as the fact that um, the category of lines of your topological field theory uh, is, the, is the same as the category of modules of your rational vertex algebra. Something analogous happens in a lot of situations with these topologically twisted supersymmetric theories. So there are a lot of situations where you can figure out what's going on in the bulk by asking how do the bulk objects act on, your, on, the, boundary, on, the, boundary, on the boundary local operators. And the reason to do so is that sometimes it's easier to do cal calculations for your boundary theory than it is to do calculations for your three-dimensional bulk. For example, in that recent paper with Tim Morte and, and Costello that I mentioned, we did not quite know how to do proper calculations to the structures we found in the bulk, but we figured out how to, cal how to do calculations for boundary local operators to get statements analogous to this relation between WCW models and just Simon's theory. So the same way as three-dimensional Chesamos theory gives you a, a natural place to study rational vertex algebras, these three-dimensional topologically twisted uh, theories give a natural place to study a variety of non-unitary uh, vertex algebras, such as logarithmic vertex algebras. 
so this is another place where there, there is a lot of potential for uh, communication between math and physics. Now, if you're a mathematician or a physicist who want to do calculations in this, uh, in this topologically twisted theories, which tools are available to you? So, as I was mentioning, ultimately, most of the calculations just require perturbation theory, or not even that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the calculations are just semi-classical because the couplings are uh, not really important. But semi-classical calculations can be surprisingly challenging, uh, especially when you're dealing with maybe infinite dimensional spaces or field configurations, or, um, or if you're trying to, you know, to, to figure out some complicated uh, derived structure out of your, out of your calculations. Uh, you're trying to you know, figure out what's the three algebra of local operators, or what's the category of, of lines. But there is an ongoing effort to systematize my classical calculations with the, with the help of the right geometry and to, and to develop a general theory of geometric quantization at the categorical level uh, using algebraic geometry uh, often. And so there is, a, there is a sort of growing mathematical toolbox that one can use to really just take a Lagrangian of these twisted theories uh, take the equations of motion and apply this some machinery to it to produce categories, to produce uh, E3 algebra, so whatever. Uh, now, once you produce this data, what do you do with it? Well, there are two possible ways the information can flow. On one hand, so this, it's often the case in, in, the, in the physical setup that you can have different definitions of the same quantum field theory. These are called dualities. So you can have different Lagrangians, which in the, you, you write down in the UV, but flow in the infrared to the same quantum field theory. Uh, these dualities are often very powerful and an important way to learn about quantum field theory. And whenever you have a duality involving some theories with admitted topological twist. That means that two different ways of computing these quantities must give you the same answer. So this can be one way to test dualities, to, to propose new dual, dualities, if you can compute these quantities, or vice versa, if you have a reason to believe that, that the duality uh, occurs, you can work back and get a power, some, some interesting mathematical conjecture, the same mathematical object as two different descriptions. I mean, we saw this happen with mirror symmetry. Uh, that's a, that was a perfect example of that. You have different ways to define the same dimensional supersymmetric quantum field theory. Uh, you have topological twists of this quantum field theory, the A and B twist. Uh, there are categories associated with these twists. There are um, ring, color rings, or whatever. And the whole of topological mirror, the whole of dimensional mirror symmetry the whole machinery of dimensional mirror symmetry was developed to verify these categories of these algebras are the same for different descriptions of the, of the underlying theory. And so all of that can be repeated and extended in three dimensions, four dimension, and more. Uh, right. So um, I mean, to, 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 to reiterate on this, so a lot of these quantities that are computed by the protective theories are RG flow invariants. They, they just, be, if your theory is topological or holomorphic, you can just, you can clearly zoom in or zoom out without changing the answer. And the correlation function does not depend on distance. Clearly nothing changes if you scale the distances by some amount. And so these protected quantities are perfect examples of RG flow invariants. For standard quantum field theories, RG flow invariants are very rare. There are very few things you can guarantee will not change in energy flow. Anomalies, uh, you can 
that is some inequality sometimes, so like A theorem, uh, C theorem, F theorem, that constrain how many degrees of freedom can you can you lose or gain as you go down the energy flow, but little else. In supersymmetry theory, though, if you have this topological space available, you gain a lot of energy flow invariance. Uh, and so this is useful to understand energy flow, or vice versa, if you, under, if you already know what energy flow gives you, it's a way to produce interesting mathematical statements. Now, I discuss only three dimensional theories in this talk, but they are three dimensional theories are interconnected to, a, to theories in, in a lot of other dimensions. Like a mirror, I, I mentioned mirror symmetry, for example. Mirror symmetry is a statement about two dimensional, Chukumachu theories. Uh, these Chukumachu theories can actually appear as boundary conditions for three dimensional and equal flow theories. So, studying three dimensional and equal flow theories actually provides new insights about Schulte theories, too. Uh, for example, the A and B model for the two dimensional theories can be promoted often to E, okay, to modules for the 3D algebras. Uh, Conversely, the three-dimensional theories can be placed at the boundary of four-dimensional theories. And so, uh, these twisted three-dimensional theories don't play, play an important role also in the physical understanding of, of things like the geometric Langdon problem. So, they, they have a lot of connection with mathematics, and uh, several of those connections have, have still to be fully uh, developed. But I think uh, an important new, important difference with respect to what was happening in, 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 in 2D mirror symmetry is that they involve whole new branches of mathematics, which are not involved. So to mention mirror symmetry was mostly about geometry. Geometrical ABR manifolds, maybe, uh, on the other hand, in, in, when you study these dimensional and equal flow theories, you encounter problems in um, uh, geometric representation theory, in algebraic geometry. Uh, so, uh, it's in, in, vert, in the theory of vertex algebras. So, they, they bring together and they, uh, a, lot, a lot of communities which don't always talk to each other. And of course, they, they, they bring together. Uh, physics. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they establish uh, new connections between uh, physics and these areas of math. One final thing I wanted to mention, uh, that this topological twist uh, is also interesting to study in the context of holography. So, a lot of these three-dimensional and equal four theories uh, can have holographic duals. They can be dual to, to gravity or supergravity or better string theory or theory on certain, or certain backgrounds of the form until they sit times something. Um, whenever you have some protected quantities on the, on the side of quantum field theory, they must correspond to some protected quantities on the side of supergravity. And so, you can try to, to establish precise matches between the topological twist of these three D theories and something analogous to the topological twist done on the supergravity side. Uh, Karen Costello introduced the theory of twisted supergravity to do that. Uh, and so you can, you can hope to get sort of provable and completely understandable subsectors of holography just by taking uh, a topological twist of non non holographic dualities. Okay, this is all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Davide, for this very uh, interesting talk. So now we have uh, some time for questions. Maybe I'll start with a question. Uh, so, um, so at the beginning, you mentioned these three n equal two theories. So suppose I take the uh, the Vesimino model with a single chiral uh, multiplet. 
So just a mm -hmm. complex scalar and a fermion. And uh, let's say with the, a cubic superpotential. So there's, I think people believe there's an RG flow towards an infrared fixed point that's super conformal. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now, so if I twist this theory now, what, what happens? What is the resulting theory I get if I do this holomorphic topological twist? So, right, so you, you will get one of these uh, algebras of Karal algebras. Uh, with, in the paper with, with Tudor and, and Kevin, we, we do compute some of the higher operations that are involved in the, that. Uh, the other question is what to do with that. Um, so in some situations, you, I mean, it, it might be that this, this, this theory is dual to a, to a gauge theory, right? A similar model like the XYZ model, where you yes. have three fields and the potential XYZ is dual to uh, QED uh, with one flavor. And so you can ask, uh, how, how do I compare the holomorphic topological twists of the XYZ model and of QED? So what we did was actually to find boundary conditions for these two theories which match under the duality. And we proved that the Karal algebra at the boundary was the same for the two. Now we have a conjecture that the bulk structure can be obtained, can be reconstructed from the boundary structure uh, in some sense of some, some kind of a center of the boundary algebra. And so, uh, if you be here, believe that, or if you can do the explicit calculation, uh, this gives this gives a very strong check on the on this duality. Okay, so both for this uh, cubic, like x cube or x y z, is going to be some non-unitary TQFT basically that you get. Yeah, it's not a TQFT because it's holomorphic topological. So you have some operators. Uh, so I mean, so correlation functions in principle depend holomorphically on the on the plane. Uh, at the boundary, you just get the Karal algebra. So you get a bunch of local operators with some of E. Okay, so there, there's a bulk boundary correspondence, a bit like in the quantum hall in a sense. Yes, so yes. Very nice. That's right. So that, that's the, the hope that there is always some kind of a bulk to boundary correspondence, at least if your boundary is interesting enough. In a topological setup uh, where, you, where both the boundary and the bulk are topological, you get statements like the bulk is the Dreamfeld center of the boundary. Uh, in, a, in a setting where the boundary is holomorphic and the bulk is topological, you the statement I was mentioning that somehow the, uh, the, the category of of bulk to discuss the bulk is the category of modules for the Karal algebra. In this homomorphic topological setting, the precise statement is not not known, but uh, but something like that should be should be correct. So there's a question from uh, Nicole Agarbal. So uh, uh, Nicole, you can either uh, unmute yourself, or I can also read your question if you prefer. Maybe I'll read the question. Um, so the question is, is the omega deformation of the Gates theory linked to the AGT conjecture since it brings about the rotational invariance? So if you are in four dimension with an equal two supersymmetry, uh, then you could do an omega deformation in two planes and that will reduce the four dimensional theory to a zero dimensional theory, uh, which is, uh, you know, which gives you a partition function, which is the subject of AGT. Uh, actually, a lot of AGT could be understood by going one dimension higher and thinking about five dimensional supersymmetric H theory and doing omega deformation in two directions so that you get a one dimensional system. And recognizing that this one dimensional system is essentially the algebra of modes for a W algebra. In, uh, in three dimension and two dimensions, the formations in, in the plane give you uh, analogs of the AGT statements, but they involve vortex modeling spaces and uh, finite W algebras. 
for example, there are some statements that if you take the, so again, if you have a two dimensional theory and you do the omega deformation, you're gonna get a, just a partition function. You have a zero dimensional system, now you get an, a function of the parameters. Uh, this is sometimes called the I function or J function. Um, and for some theories, this I function or J function happen to look like uh, correlators in some finite W algebra. And you can use the relation to three-dimensional uh, A twist or B twist to explain that. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, really nice talk, uh, David. Uh, just wanted to get back to this um, discussion you made on defects and mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned a kind of an example of like anions is like line a line line defect mm -hmm. for example um, could you just elaborate a little bit more on why it's called why do you call it a defect and and maybe another example yes well the the canonical example is the Wilson loop the Wilson okay. line okay okay right I define the Wilson line effectively by taking a simple quantum quantum mechanical system like this, you know, five-dimensional Hilbert space and uh, some, some spin acting on it, and coupling it to my four-dimensional gauge fields. So it's a defect because I just changed what was going on at that location. I added extra degrees of freedom. I modified how the fields behave there. Um, right, so that's pretty much the definition of the defect. Okay, okay. It's some local modification of a the theory which in a way behaves like a sub-theory. Uh, I thought this, this notion can be sometimes a bit deceptive. Yeah, good, okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah, right, the, the other prototypical example of the effect is a boundary condition. So if I just cut, you know, cut space mm -hmm. time into put some manual conditions that defines a defect. Okay, so maybe uh, one last question. Okay, so if not, uh, please join me in the thanking the day for a very, uh, very nice talk. Okay, one more question, sorry, from Nakul. Uh, so the question is, what is the cause of the Higgs branches? How are they derived from normal nilpotent orbits? Um, so for some three-dimensional theories, the Higgs branch is a nilpotent orbit. Um, if you think about nilpotent orbit in, in A-type, you can just write on a quiver gauge theory whose called whose six branch is a uh, is a is an important orbit. In general, if you know that your important orbit is a, can be written as a symplectic quotient, you can engineer a theory whose six branch is an important orbit. Um, now, not all important orbits are uh, symplectic quotients, uh, but they are expected to all be. Oh, most of them are supposed to be Higgs branches or some theories, although those theories might not allow a Lagrangian description. Might not be easy to describe in terms of fields and of gauge fields and matter fields. Typically, there are constructions using a you know, theory, string theory, or, or other reasons to believe that these theories should exist. Sorry, uh, Frank, I, have, go ahead. I have a question uh, that falls from your response to Rick's question about the uh, uh, where you, you you said that a, uh, a boundary condition could serve as a defect. Then, then is is there always a defect? Like, what what is the boundary condition that constitutes that it's there's no defect? 
No, I mean, so when you put the boundary condition and there is always the defect there, which is the boundary. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I'm from condensed matter. So mm -hmm. we often will think about a, a periodic solid and for us, no defect might be a um, periodic boundary condition. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, unfortunately here, the notion of boundary condition is, the, the word boundary condition is a little bit loaded. Uh, uh, I really mean a local boundary condition. Not, not a surface or, or something like that. That means that I, I give the definition, I define my theory on a plus times. Uh, on, on? On half space, on a half space. Yeah. And I define it in such a way that uh, the definition is local. So. I mean, if you have a lattice, you can just cut your lattice and, and put some boundary degrees of freedom, perhaps, and put some Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, again, I grew up with lattices going on forever. And then, um, and then when we started taking uh, surfaces more seriously, then all sorts of physics crops up. Like Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the, surf, the boundary can have its own collection of local operators, its own physics. Yeah, okay. Uh, And right, and sometimes you can reconstruct properties of the bulk from properties of the boundary in these topological settings. Okay. Often it might be very hard to see that there is something interesting going on in the bulk, but it becomes clearer once you put the boundary. Okay, so it seems like uh, there are no more questions. So with that, uh, we'll conclude the seminar. So once again, uh, thanks, thanks very much to Davide for this uh, very interesting talk. And uh, so the recording will be posted eventually for uh, everybody to access. And uh, that's it. So uh, everybody have a good night. You too. Thanks. Thank you.